I'm in bed. The next thing I know, a woman is over me like this. She seems like a huge giant to me. I start getting major pain on my right side. Reluctantly, I follow her up the stairs. It felt like there was something wrong. She disappeared into the darkness. We're not supposed to be up there. We were intruding. I heard her scream. So the show's finished, and the place is really deserted. I feel this tug on my sleeve. I just got this chill feeling and this cold feeling, and I'm, I'm getting it now. And I turned and looked, and I looked down. At nighttime, I'd hear these, these footsteps. There would be nothing there. I'd see this shadow that had no solid form to it. And I'm going, what the heck is that? What was that? I had no idea what it was. <laughs> hey, there's got to be more to life than this, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we're here. We're not here for a long time. You're here for the best you can make out of it. And I believe there is a spirit world out there. There is, there is spirits, and there is. I believe there is. Well, in 1994, I, I, was, I started doing a series called American Adventures. And we would take people on these adventures and uh, things that you could do on vacations. And it was a show in which we traveled around the world. We went to Thailand, went to Egypt. And in February of 96, we went to the south of France. And we stayed at this hotel called La Reserve de Beaulieu. It was built in 1880. And it's right on the water, right on the Mediterranean, right there. Beautiful place, beautiful hotel, just gorgeous. So we decided we're gonna do some horseback riding north of, of the hotel, because we wanted to shoot a segment about horseback riding in the south of France, up in the hills, how beautiful and exciting it could be and fun. So we ride and we do some shots and this and that. We had a guide. <laughs> And I'm on my horse, and I'm holding the rein with my right hand, got this hand by my side, and we're trekking and riding. And he says, hey, Mr. Strada, would you like to have my heart? It was like a gesture of you know, friendship. And I said, sure, why not? Let me try it on. You know, felt like a cowboy, right? So he takes the hat, and he goes to give it to me, but he waves it like in front of the horse. <laughs> So the horse spooks, and he starts spinning. The horse starts to spin, so I grab the horn, and I start spinning and spinning and spinning. <laughs> and I fly off the horse, and I land on a tree stump. I land on my back, hit me right between the shoulder blades. I get up, and I want to cold cock the horse, you know, but it's not the horse's fault. So I get back on the horse, and I'm cool and everything, and everything's fine. I don't realize that, hey, did you get hurt or what? Because I didn't feel any pain. So that night, we get back to the hotel, and I start getting major pain on my right side, right around here. And I'm noticing that I can't, you know, I can't breathe well. So I called the doctor, and he said, it seems that you may have a broken rib. And I get really pissed off, because we got filming tomorrow, you know? We got a lot of segments to shoot, and I knew one of them was on a boat, on a cigarette boat, and they already had rented the boat. And I don't want to hold a production. You don't want to do that. So I got uptight, and I got worried. And I said, oh my God, what am I gonna do? Oh, come on, man, this has gotta get better, oh, please. So 
So later on, I'm in the room and I'm getting in bed and trying to get comfortable so I can go to sleep, get some rest. Even if I moved just a little bit, it would hurt. I open my eyes and I look over and I see a woman standing by the window. She had long dark hair and wearing like a half cap and she's dressed in white and she was just like looking out the window like this and just staring out. I'm thinking, well, who is this person? What is this? What's going on? And then all of a sudden, I feel this sharp pain. It's just really bad, and I'm getting short of breath. I could have punctured my lung because I feel the pain. It scared me. I can't, you know, I can't breathe, and it really hurts. The next thing I know, this woman that was by the window is now over me like this, looking at me like this, just looking down at me. She seems like a huge giant to me. And she's looking down at me. I was so scared. And then she takes her right hand and puts it on the side of, of my rib cage. And then takes her left hand and puts it over my eyes. And she's looking at me, looking straight at me. And then I hear, don't worry, you're gonna be fine. Just like that, fine. I hear, don't worry, you're gonna be fine. Just like that, fine. The next thing I know, it's morning time. The light was coming in through the window and she was gone. So I get up and on a scale from one to 10 in pain, maybe I'm feeling a two as opposed to the 10 I was feeling the night before. I believe she really did something to me she took the pain with her. She took it away. So I go down to breakfast, and uh, the rest of the crew, they're down there. And they were asking me, how you feeling? How's, how's, your, how's your rib? And I proceeded to tell them the story about the woman at the window and then coming over and putting a hand on my rib and covering my eyes and telling me, don't worry, you're going to be fine. and waking up and feeling way better and ready to go to work. And a lot of them, their attitude was, yeah, Strata, yeah, we got you, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I get a lot of comments. After we all finish and everybody's dispersing, going to get the equipment, getting ready for what we're gonna shoot that day, the lady who's the hostess came over to me and said to me, excuse me, Miss, Monsieur Estrada, I was overhearing your story about uh, a woman in your room. And she shows me these uh, pictures of the monastery across the road. And she showed me a page where they had these nuns that were there. So when I'm looking at the pictures, I see one that catches my attention. I said, the woman that was in the room. And she says, well, that is Sister Marguerite. And she died of the fever. And she proceeds to tell me, this hotel was used for hospital stays for people during World War II. Ah. 
and the sisters of St. Augustine, these nuns from the monastery would come over. And they would uh, service all the soldiers, take care of them. I said, really? And she says, well, you know, we've had other people that have stayed here in this hotel. And she's only appeared to people that have been ill or have gotten hurt. I said, well, really? Well, then she must have come in my room last night and took care of me, because I feel good today. That day, I was fine, fine enough to get in a boat and get bounced around and not be in total discomfort. If this spirit hadn't showed up, I probably wouldn't have been on the boat that day and really ruined the shoot. She must have, when she was alive, helped others. And I believe when people die, they're able to continue their goodness as spirits. And that's why when I was hurting, that spirit nun appeared to me to help me. So people always ask me, you, know, you worked in the paranormal activity movies, are you a believer, are you a skeptic? What's the deal with that? And I always say the same thing. I used to be a skeptic like my dad, but uh, in Connecticut when I was 16, something happened and uh, now I'm a believer. It was 1997, I was 16 years old, and uh, my dad, his business got pretty successful. And uh, we moved into this mansion. The house was built in the early 1900s. It's the kind of house where I got lost in it for the first few months that I was living there. When I first moved to the house, my sister, Ariana, she's two years younger than me, and we would go exploring all over the house, including the third floor. And no one lived on the third floor. The, the third floor was, uh, was used for storage. There was some weirdness on the third floor that we didn't really fully appreciate at the time. A coldness that is palpable, it kind of chills you to your bones. There were a lot of books that were often out of place. Pictures would flip around. Ashtrays would be turned over. There would be odd configurations of like things balanced on other things that didn't make any sense. This one time there was a box of tissues and all the tissues were on the floor. It looked like someone had been crying, but no one ever went up there, so it didn't make any sense. Third floor is something else. It was early December, and uh, there's this crazy huge storm that set in. It was a nor'easter, and it was kind of fun at first. All of a sudden, and the power had gone out. My sister decides that it's a great idea to go exploring all over the house. So we grabbed our flashlights, so just run around and explore in the dark. And uh, my sister thought it would be a great idea to explore the third floor of our house. And I told her, I'm not doing this. This is messed up. The lights are out. It's scary. Don't be a baby. And at a certain point, I have to do it because I'm the older brother, and I wasn't going to let her do it alone. Reluctantly, I follow her up the stairs. And uh, it got pretty weird after that. I was staying back, and not out of fear entirely. I was, I'll admit, I was a little scared, but it, mostly because it felt like there was something wrong. 
We're not supposed to be up there. We were intruding. She wandered down the hall, opening up all the doors, looking in all of them. And I said, you know, like, let, let's just get out of here. It's not fun anymore. Yeah. She didn't listen to me, as little sisters seldom do. She got to the end of the hallway. And at the end of the hallway, there's a heavy, thick door that's different from all the other doors in the hallway. I never even had gone that far into the house to explore the room at the end of the hall. And she opened it. And she walked inside. And uh, she disappeared into the darkness. And I'm standing there at the top of the stairs, just waiting for her to come out. And she didn't. There's this sense of something was about to happen that was bad. It started to, like my hair in the back of my neck started to stand up. The door closed by itself. I remember really clearly, because it was like an unnatural motion. I don't know how a door could move like that unless someone was pushing it, and it was not her. I was pretty freaked out. I said, Ariana, what's going on? And she didn't answer. And then all of a sudden, I was pretty freaked out. I said, Ariana, what's going on? And she didn't answer. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> I heard her scream. I ran to the end of the hall, threw open the door. And she was just gone. She wasn't in the room. I was screaming at this point, Ariana, where are you? And I kept calling out her name. She wouldn't respond. Ariana! In the back corner of the room, there was a jagged hole cut out of the wood. And as I stuck my head through the hole, I could see this room. There was this ratty old mattress. There was a, a rocking chair. And then I saw my sister. She was standing there, just white as a ghost. took my flashlight and I shine it. I could see like some human form or human face and I could see the two eyes staring. <sighs> I remember this like burning intensity of these eyes. <laughs> oh my God, I grabbed my sister and I ran out of the room. Straight into my parents' bedroom. And there was a big hoopla. Everyone woke up. Said there's something on the third floor. But my mother believed me that there was something going on up there. 
My dad insisted that it was just an optical illusion, and he thought we were crazy kids, and he went back to sleep. I did not. I just stayed up all night, too scared to sleep. We waited till the next morning to go back up when the light was, was back. My dad did see the hole, and he wanted to know what was in there. And the area was an area of the house that no one had ever been to. Nobody was aware that it even existed. There was a mattress on the floor. Imagine a uh, 50s or 60s mattress. There was a, a rocking chair. The rocking chair seemed even older than that, maybe something that had been made in the 40s or 30s. And uh, the same with the dresser. Near the opening, there was a piece of chocolate layer cake. It had been like desiccated. It was moldy. It was almost like a piece from the birthday cake had been aged like 40 years. There definitely could have been somebody living up there for an extended period of time. We had to get a hold of the furniture and things out, um, and then it was boarded up. But even after we removed everything, it didn't change the feeling or the presence that was there. The house has a long history, and I had no idea that it, of, of all this history. It's something I have found out later. My father bought it from a man who had owned the house for many, many years, but was afraid to live in it. Uh, because it was haunted. Of course, my dad, being the quintessential skeptic, thought it was a great real estate investment opportunity. In the 40s, the house was owned by a, a very wealthy family. Their daughter, a single woman, lived there alone for nearly 20 years. She had a mental disorder, and her family abandoned her with no one there, not even a, a caretaker. She ended up dying in that room of mysterious causes. So I have no idea how she died or what her life was like, but that sounds pretty miserable to me. And there seems like there's something unfinished about that story. Ariana, to this day, she won't speak about it. I don't think she stepped foot on the third floor the rest of the time she lived in the house. That was a very traumatic experience. My mother brought in all kinds of people to try and cleanse the house. Nothing worked. And it's still there to this day. My father thinks it's the pipes and the wind, and my mother just doesn't go on the third floor. Neither do I. I didn't grow up believing uh, in supernatural or paranormal things at all. You know, I'm a, I'm a fairly practical, pragmatic person. You know, I used to be a person who didn't believe that these things existed, but, uh, um, but clearly, you know, clearly they do, and I've experienced it myself. So I was on tour, I was just beginning a new tour. We drive into this middle of nowhere place called Schulenburg, and it's in this very sort of rural area of Texas. All these little old storefronts and the little hardware store and the little dry goods store, and it's this beautifully preserved Texas town. This is so exciting, this is so cool. It's like stepping into a movie or something. Our first stop was this place called Sengelman Hall. The hall was this beautiful old building. It had been a dance hall that uh, served the whole sort of community of ranchers and farmers for miles and miles around. And, uh, you know, the big, like, creaky floorboards and uh, big dance hall space, and that's where we were performing. 
They had renovated it, but they hadn't really changed the, the whole plan of the space around because it, you know, it worked really well when it was a music hall, you know, 100 years ago. And we go in and we meet the people and we start unloading the gear and the people who are there say, oh, welcome to the place. And we start talking about what a great place this is and, you know, must have a lot of history. And they say, yeah, and you keep your eyes open and you'll see a ghost. I was kind of creeped out by that, but, you know, I didn't think much about it. I mean, I have to work, so we do the show, and it was a great show, it was a cool show, great crowd, like an old honky-tonk sort of crowd. So the show's finished, and everybody left, and the place was really deserted. And I was sitting at the bar and having a little nightcap and, you know, chatting with the bartender as he's cleaning up and doing his thing and just relaxing. I, you know, asked him if he had ever seen any ghosts or if he'd had any experience with this. He said that back when the renovations were being done, were, were kind of in the beginning stages, that he was in there. It was late at night and everybody had gone. And he heard two men arguing and, and fighting. And he thought maybe it was some of the construction guys or the carpenters or something. He turned around and there was nobody in there. I was kind of creeped out by that. And the bartender kind of turns away. And I'm sipping my drink, and the bartender's doing his thing. I'm sipping my drink, and he's doing his thing. feel this tug on my sleeve. I looked around, I looked down, and, you know, nobody was there. I thought, oh, maybe, maybe my sleeve is, like, caught in my belt or something, and didn't think anything about it. And I turned back to the bartender. We were chit-chatting a little bit more about, you know, about the history of the area and about the history of this place, this old music hall. and. He goes back to do what he's going to do. And I feel this tug again. And it's a very definite tug. It's very insistent. And just this whole side of my body where the tugging was happening, I just got this, this, this chill feeling and this cold feeling. And I'm, I'm getting it now, too. <laughs> And I turned and looked, and I looked down, and I see this little boy. Very thin and very small frame boy. He almost looked, I mean, the, the color of, of, the, uh, of the land and of the countryside out there, it's very barren, it's very dusty. He almost looked like he was made of dust. He had that very pale, look about him. He just, he didn't, he didn't look like flesh and blood. I was shocked. I was like, oh my God, this is a real entity. I locked eyes with him just for a second. And out of the corner of my eye, it was like I could see these other figures of children in the other parts of the room, in the corners of the room, down at the end of the bar, over by the door. Then they were gone. And I turned back to the bartender, and I must have been white as a sheet, because he came over. He said, what, what just happened? Are you all right? And I was like, I, 
I think something pulled on my sleeve. And he was like, oh, you saw one of the children, didn't you? And I, and I told him what I had seen, and he started talking to me about Back in the, days of the, depression. Uh, the children who used to come into the bar back in the day when it was a dance hall and come and get their daddies, try to get their daddies to come back home and stop drinking in the bar at the end of the night. And, you know, this little child was like pleading and pleading for her daddy to come home and not drink away all the money because they needed that money to feed themselves, you know? They needed that money to support the family. A lot of times um, in that day and age, you would have these big families and not all the children would survive to adulthood. And, uh, you know, this, this must have been the ghost of one of these children who was like, Daddy, come home, Daddy, come home. You know, I'm a mother myself, and it was just, uh, it was really kind of, it really affected me. And the bartender was like, this is something that happens. We, we have these sightings. People see and hear these spirits all the time. You know, I don't know whether that child chose to come to me because I'm a mother myself and because that part of my being has become so sensitized to having a child of my own. And it's, uh, and it's upsetting to think about them not being at rest and not being at peace. Growing up, I was very, very well aware of ghosts and spirits and whatnot because when my grandfather passed, I remember seeing him at the top of the stairs one night. And that was um, my first experience with uh, the paranormal. And then nothing happened until this time I had my experience with this condo. I had been living in Hollywood for about six years at the time, and I was finally able to buy a piece of property and I found this um, condo that these two gentlemen were selling, and uh, they were living in the condo as I was buying it, and so they had to move before I was able to move in. And when I moved in, I was very excited about a fresh start, you know, in a brand new place. But then after a period of time, strange things started to happen. At nighttime, I would hear noises, I'd hear footsteps. But every time I'd hear these, these footsteps, there would be nothing there. At nighttime, I would hear noises, I'd hear footsteps. But every time I'd hear these, these footsteps, there would be nothing there. This one night, I was sleeping. I feel the oddest sensation. Like 
feel like fingers touching me on the hand, and touching me across the face very softly. And then out of the corner of my eye, I see this shadow in the hallway go past like a dark mist, like just walk by. It had a shape, you know, but it had no solid form to it. And I got up to see if somebody was walking past, but there was no one there. I had no idea what it was or who it was. It made me very nervous. So, my brother met this psychic. Her name was Johnny. He told me to go to her because she had the most amazing ability. And so I went to her, and she's the kind of psychic that would ask you questions pertaining to people and whatnot. And she called out my, my mother's name. She called out my grandmother's name. And then during the reading, She asked me, she said, well, who's James? She said, James is the one in your apartment. And I was like, wow. James was the name of the person that I purchased the condo from. I called my real estate person, and she told me that uh, James had passed. He was stricken with a heart attack and he passed away after I purchased the condo. James was very attached to the apartment. They had lived there for quite a long time when I purchased the place. I mean, they had been there for about 10 to 15 years. And I just got the sense that James didn't want to sell the place as much as his partner, Alan, did. A couple of nights later, I was sleeping. All of a sudden, I hear the most horrible sound of glass breaking and crashing and, you know, just chaos. And I woke up and I'm going, what the heck is that? What was that? And there on the floor was this huge mirror sitting in the center of the floor, unbroken, with a glass lamp sitting in the center of the mirror, just sitting there. And I was like, did this just happen? It was like somebody had placed it there so delicately. Because if the mirror had fallen, it would have broken. It was very unnerving. And as I turned, I saw James. He had on the same clothing as when I first met him. And I, you know, blinked and he was gone. You know, I'm a man, I don't, you know, I don't scare easily, but I was scared out of my mind. After that, I had my house blessed. I had a, a preacher come in and bless my home and I put a cross at the entranceway of my house. I think someone who loves a, a place that they live in so much that they don't want to leave, I guess it's um, 
sort of sad that they remain there, you know. And uh, maybe James uh, finally went home because he's not here anymore.